Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to have you this morning. God bless you. It's an honor and a privilege to see several special guests with us again today. I want to say it's such a privilege to have uh, Ann, uh, uh, Glenda's son, Richard's son, Aaron, and Julia with us today. God bless y'all. So good to have you. Good to have each one of you with us. Praise God. Would you please quickly open your Bibles to the book of St. Mark? To the book of St. Mark. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you enjoy the message, and I'll do my best not to hold you over two hours this morning, but if you enjoy the message this morning, you've got to be here tonight. It will hold hands with this message. I'm speaking tonight on how you can experience greater power and authority in your life you've got to hear the message tonight i'm reading to you from saint mark the 13th chapter saint mark the 13th chapter and i want to start with the 34th verse 34th verse for the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and listen to this, and gave authority to his servant and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Most of all, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, would you continue to anoint me that I might speak the words that are of a necessity for this hour. For every person that you have sent to HTA. And we will give you the praise. In Jesus' name we ask it. And everybody said. Excuse me just one moment. I want to speak to you this morning on are you walking in God's authority? Are you walking in God's authority? Every day of our lives, Satan is doing his best to try to pass thoughts. He's trying to pass feelings within us. He's trying to pass attitudes. He is trying to control each and every one of us through our hearts and through our minds. It is the purpose of the devil to not allow you to experience the blessings of God, not allow you to understand what God has given to you, and keep you discouraged, bound, and tormented. That is his purpose. The word of the Lord tells us, if we allow these seeds a bad thought, a bad feeling, a bad attitude, if we allow these seeds to take root, they will produce a negative crop within your life. And there will be many things that will come and flow from you that is not like and is contrary to the word of the Lord. How many of you know the word of the Lord is our path? It is the light. It is the way that we must follow. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Death and, what's the other? Life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you have a, how many ever had a bad attitude? 
Thank you for being honest today. I've got a lot of honest sheep. We've all had bad attitudes, bad, terrible feelings. We've all been vexed and tormented with thoughts in our mind. But if we, stay with me now, if we do not speak those things, we do not give life to them. We do not birth them. And thereby create more havoc for our lives. Now there is and will be an inner battle But God will give you victory over your attitude, your thoughts, the intents of your heart and your mind if you do not birth it. If you will not birth it, you do not set an atmosphere of negativity. But you put constraints upon what the devil is trying to get you to do. Refusing to speak anything that is contrary to this book. If we contradict the word of the Lord, how many of you believe this? If we contradict the word of the Lord, God's power and presence cannot work with us. Now I'm getting ready to take you somewhere. I believe the Holy Spirit has dealt with me this week and has spoken to me. And I believe I have another step that God is ready to take HTA. I believe the Lord has revealed something to me. and I'm going to bring some of it to you this morning, some of it to you tonight. I want to ask you a question. Do not answer this except in your heart, in your mind. Listen to this. Do you believe we are to wait and pray for God to come and heal people? Do you believe we are to wait on God to show up and to come and to heal people? Or has the Lord God already healed everyone in this world? Think about it. Has He already healed everyone in this world or are we waiting with folded arms and bated breath hoping to God He will show up and heal someone? I want to ask you another question. When we pray for someone, are we to pray Dear Jesus, please heal this person. That's exactly right. He's done everything he's going to do. He's waiting on you to do something. Listen to this, and I have prayed this prayer before. We are trapped by the words that we speak. We stumble and fall and we hinder God by the way that we say things. Oh, Jesus, please heal this person. As if to say, I don't recognize what you did at Calvary as being healing. I need for you to come and do this again. Hello? Stay with me. This is going to kind of irritate some of you. Just a little bit, but stay with me. I've got this book backing me up. I'm very secure in what I'm talking about this morning. Now listen to this. 
Or are we to ask Jesus to suffer again? Or are we to take our authority in Jesus Christ and do what He told us to do? You know what we love to do? Jesus, please heal this person. If He don't, I pray Jesus didn't do it. We don't want to carry the responsibility of doing the work of Jesus. We want Him to have to carry the responsibility. But that's not the way God's Word is written. That's not the way the Word... If somebody wants to be saved, do we have to come to the altars and say... Lord Jesus, if it is your will, I wish you would please. Now, I don't know if you want to or not, but I wish you would please save this man. Is that scriptural? That is so contrary to the Word of God. Every man and woman that will ever be saved was saved and the price was paid at Calvary on the cross. The only thing a person has to do is believe it here. Believe it here. And confess with your lips and it will be done. Are you still with me? If we give birth to the evil or to the strife, we are having whatsoever we say. Because you need to write this verse down. Proverbs 18 and 20. You eat the fruit of your lips. That's what that says. You eat the fruit of your lips. You talk strife, you're going to eat it. You talk jealousy and hatred and envy, that's what your food is. You talk doubt, you talk unbelief, you don't know why God hadn't showed up to heal you and you can't understand why He don't hear your prayers, that's the kind of food you're going to eat. Because the Word of God says that you eat the fruit of your lips. The Word of the Lord tells us also in Psalms 101 and 3. Listen what Psalmist David says. I will set no wicked things before my eyes. I will put nothing before my eyes that is wicked. I will not do that. Look at the rest of the part. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I despise understanding and seeing people that are wishy-washy and not standing for what God has given to me. Thomas David says, and I refuse to put anything wicked. I sometimes wonder, there is so much rape and murder and killing and chainsaw massacres and all of this mess Hollywood has put out. I wonder what God thinks when we Christians sit before the television and watch somebody being murdered and we like it. We enjoy it. I wonder what God thinks when we enjoy the chainsaw massacre, the idiot with the helmet on, staggering around like a looney tune, sawing people in half. What if one of those people were your mother? What if one of those people were your father, was your father? That's why Psalmist David said, I cannot afford to set myself 
before things that are wicked because if I put that mess inside of me, one day my lips are going to speak and I'm going to start speaking something out and then I will have to end up eating it. I'll end up having to devour the very rotten food I have created. You see, it is so vital and so important that we hear from God. And I want you to know today God has promised us that Satan cannot do anything to us unless we yield. Or unless God's word says we empower him with our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs. Then he has an open door to come in. That's a reason so many Christians are struggling and can't ever get beyond the milk bottle. That's a reason Christians, we don't have many health spas around. There's not many men and women that are pumping iron to having those big muscles. We're all in daycare. We all put the pamper business in multimillionaires. <laughs> it, it's, it's because we don't want to carry the responsibility. But God says that Satan will not and cannot override his people. The devil can't do that. If you know how to keep him out of your mind, if you know how to keep him, hallelujah, out of your heart by the covering of the blood and the believing in Jesus Christ, hallelujah, Satan is not stronger than you are because the Lord says if you resist the devil, he will have to flee. He is not stronger than you. God put, hallelujah, His Son on this earth and Jesus Christ put His foot on the devil. And He is not that authority. Listen to this. If we will do every day what we are supposed to do, not what we want to do. I need to repeat that. If we do every day what we should do and not what we want to do, then, listen to this, God will break forth and He will use you and He will fill your life with faith and power. But you know what? We've got to believe. We have to believe in the authority of Jesus Christ. Turn to Luke 9. St. Luke. St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Does anybody here this morning believe that you have authority with God? Well, there's, thank you for those five hands. That's what I figured. If anybody has been coming regular for a while, you heard my message. Before you have power flowing from your life, you first have to believe and walk in the authority. I give the, the example. If a policeman stops you, he has the authority to stop you. Now, he has power backing him up. But if you submit, he doesn't have to use power. Now, you can take a stick and knock him in the head and take off. But there's a camera on his dash that has filmed your beautiful car and your face. And... Since you do not respect his authority, he will show you his power. Because there will be some blues coming after you. And I've said this in another sermon. If they can't get you, the state highway patrol will join them. 
If the state highway patrol can't get you, they'll bring in the National Guard. They'll bring in the army. I'm telling you, there's power behind authority. But do you believe that you have authority as God's people? Do you really believe that? Look at uh, Luke 9 and 1. Then he, Jesus, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power, listen, and authority over one third of all the devils in your county. Oh, I'm sorry. He gave you authority and power over how many? All, all devils. And to pray for some people and they would be healed and diseases would be cursed and the rest tough luck. All. Who, listen, now I'm going to get in your living room right now. Who is to take authority over demons? And who is to take authority over diseases, Jesus or you? You got it. It isn't, Jesus, please do this. Jesus is saying, you lazy person. I did it. As George Bush Sr. says, read my lips. <laughs> if you pray and ask Jesus to come heal you, you're going to be praying the rest of your life. He isn't going to come down from heaven and heal you. He's already made a way. You're going to have to get up and get to someone that has some authority and believes the word and doesn't just play with words. I was reading a story. Anybody remember Kenneth Hagin? You talk about a man that believed in the authority of God. It's not what you feel. You will probably never feel the authority before you start using it. You'll never realize authority is in you. Kenneth Hagin was a man that walked with the Lord and one night Jesus after a praying Jesus walked into his room these are his words and started talking to Kenneth Hagin and brother Hagin I don't know if he was standing or laying in bed I don't, I don't know during the conversation while Jesus was talking, a little devil comes into the room, hopefully smaller than I am, gets between him and Jesus and starts doing crazy things, screaming, hollering. And Kenneth Hagin, listen now, Kenneth Hagin said, why don't Jesus do something about this? Oh, Jesus, why is the devil on my back? Please, Jesus, get the devil off of my back. Turn around and slap that devil cross out him. And tell him where you live. And tell him who you have inside of you. I'm telling you, we're stepping into a place here at HTA where men and women are going to come alive under the authority of God Almighty. Hallelujah! 
And Jesus just kept talking, kept talking. And all of a sudden, here it is, Kenneth Hagin gets angry. My dad always said, if you would get as mad at the devil as you do your wife, the devil would leave you alone and never bother you. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin says, you devil. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. And that little imp, boom. You know what Jesus told him? Kenneth, if, he, if you had not done it, I could not. <gasps> Jesus can do anything. Well, why don't he stop someone from raping a young girl? Why don't he stop crying? No. He will not go past his word. And his word says he gave man power and authority in this world. And he gave us the authority to cast out devils, to heal the sick. Hallelujah. To raise the dead and cleanse the leper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You should not be angry at Jesus. You should not be angry at God or the Holy Ghost. You should go look in the mirror and say, There's the rascal I should have my anger on. Because the church of Jesus Christ is not walking in authority. About six people raise their hand. You know what? I know some of you are thinking, well, is he tricking me? Every one of you should have your hand up. Did you know, even if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Pentecostals are strong, and I'm strong in that. We believe in the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But even if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you still have power over the devil. Yes, you do. You have power. Well, why don't I feel it? You walk not by feelings. God doesn't want you to feel it before you act on it. He wants you to walk by, there it is, not by sight, not by feelings, not by the moving of man or the relationship that you have built with other people. He wants you to stand on the word of God and believe that he has given you authority over the devil. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Mm. Anybody ever heard of Bill Johnson? Do you think the power of God is more favorable out there in his state than it is in western North Carolina? No, sir. But you know what he's done? He's raised up young people, and he has... Put it in their head. Look you. Look you. Look you. You have authority. Why don't you stand on the authority God's given to you? Do you believe the word? Do you believe that he cannot, he is not a man that he can lie? Do you believe that his word is true? And he is no respecter of persons. I don't care what you've done in your life. If you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you are covered by the blood of Jesus. And the, the Holy Ghost has stepped inside. You know what the Holy Ghost can do to the devil? Do you know what Popeye can do when he gets that can of spinach? What's his name? Bluto? Plu not Pluto. 
Pluto. My wife's trying to get me to say Pluto. <laughs> do you know what he can do with that power? Hallelujah. Shut up, Ruta Yamahaya. Matthew 28 and 18. Glory be to God. The Bible says, let me just read that. It's the day that Jesus goes up. Ascension. I got to read it to you. You'll think I'm making it up. 18, uh, 28 chapter. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, let me, let me just uh, talk to you just a minute. All power was given to Jesus Christ in heaven and in earth. When he goes away, it would have been so sad if he had kept all of that power and authority. How disappointing it would have been if he kept all that power and that authority. But he did not. Listen what he said. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. What was he saying? I have all power and authority, and now I give this to you. Do my work. Do my work. I'm not going to turn to it, but Matthew 10 and 8 says, I commission you, I call you, I command you to go forth and heal the sick. I don't want you to ask me to heal them. I've already done it. I don't want you to plead with me to do something. Oh, Jesus, come down and save people in Asheville. No, get yourself out of the recliner and get out into the streets and start witnessing and telling people about Jesus and God will start doing things and revival will break out. It will break out within lives and the hearts of people. We have begged God for revival. We have pleaded. We have asked God to do everything. We are still asking and begging and pleading when He has done everything He's going to do. And it is time for us to understand it's now in our court. It's in our court. And if we don't take a stand, we will not experience what God has promise to us. A preacher I was reading after, I've read after him for a long time. He uh, lived with his parents and uh, with his grandmother at times. And finally, the grandmother uh, because of ill health, decided to just live with them. And he had been with his grandmother for eight years. Eight years. And at the age of eight, his grandmother died. His grandmother did not walk with the Lord and had attracted evil spirits. And those evil spirits had vexed her and tormented her for years. When she died, this minister said that he, at eight years old, decided uh, after probably a short period of time to take grandma's bedroom and quit having to share the bedroom with his other brother. He moves into Grandma's bedroom. Was it but a night or two later, her picture is on the dresser, and it wasn't a night or two later 
So Grandma, every night, would come out of her pitcher and walk around in the bedroom. He said, I was freaking out. But I was so afraid to tell anybody about it. And after Grandma come out of that photograph, several times he went to his brother and says, Brother, I'm moving back in with you. <laughs> his other brother said, You are? Yes, I am. His other brother said, Well, I'll take Grandma's room. He goes down there, a couple of days, comes back and said, I believe I'll room with you. <laughs> Their sister said, y'all don't want grandma's room? I'll take it. She goes, a couple of days, I'm going back to my little bedroom. They lock the doors and they locked that room for 18 years this minister finally walked into a place with God and started understanding Jesus will never show up and say shoo devil shoo 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 Jesus isn't going to come down with a bottle of oil and anoint it. That's not his job anymore. He, his body's on earth. Hello? His body is on earth. Eighteen years later, this preacher says, I had sweated this thing. But the Lord told me if that devil was going to go, I had to do it. He says, when the time came, I don't know what he did, but he said, when the time came, he says, I unlocked that room. I walked into that room, and I was felt like every hair was standing up on my head. I turned around, and I locked the door behind me. Ooh, brave man. Brave man. I locked the door behind me. And he said to himself, Oh God, somewhere in this room there is a devil probably as big as head is to that ceiling and he has big fangs and he's ready to just chomp down on me. Would you please do something about it? And the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm waiting on you to do something. And I want to tell you something. If you could see the demon in here right now, you would laugh. Because he's nothing but an imp. But he does have a big mouth. And he will intimidate you if you let him. But I'm waiting on you to do it. And that preacher said all of a sudden, the authority of God rose up inside of him and he started taking authority over that evil spirit. And that evil spirit, he never did see it, but it left had nothing to fear but fear itself. I told you about Mildred Wicks, a personal friend of our family that was dying and laying on her couch and the devil came in and he had his hands behind him and he walked up to her laying on the bed and said, I'm going to kill you. And she began to rebuke him. She was so weak near death and he laughed at her. She said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. He still laughed. 
And she gained some more strength, and she said, In the name of Jesus, I, co- I, I, not Jesus, it's your job. I command you to get out of this house. And all of a sudden, that big devil turned around and ran out of the house. And she looked, and his hands was tied behind him. <laughs> Hands was tied behind him. Why? The authority that God had given to her and to you. We live in defeat. We live in discouragement. James 4, I'm closing with the scripture. James 4 and 7. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Are you really saying if you will submit yourself to the Lord, and you resist the devil and take your authority, he will Run from you? Why have we been living like we have and not taking our stand as we submit unto God? Now you cannot, you cannot walk in your own way. You can't sit before the television and watch all that mess and blood and guts and nudity and expect to command demons. They're not going to listen to you. You can't play with God and play church and want to take some of the gospel and leave some of it alone. Either you take it all or get out of the way because you're going to get run over. Because somebody's going to grab the truth and they're going to run with it. Somebody's going to believe in the authority that he has given to us. How many hundreds of hours have we said, Jesus, please fill me. How many hundreds of hours have we wept and cried, Jesus, please deliver me. Please, Jesus, make these devils leave me alone. How long have we prayed prayers contrary to the word of God? Contrary. And if you're and, and let me say this. It's not that we're doing it intentionally. It is tradition of man. I have to watch my mouth or now I'll say, "Lord Jesus, I ask you to heal this person." I have to be very careful. It's a, it it is a bad habit. That's why we have to be transformed. If you will just think about yourself. Oh God, do you really love me? Do you really love me? Get rid of these devils. You'll be saying that in your wheelchair. 25 years from now. You got to stand up. You got to stand up. Well, what if it don't work? What if it does? What if it does? Yet a son and a brusoya. Here may come to run near a near a surya gaya. The Holy Ghost is so powerful, isn't it? Do you know in Africa right now? This shows you how much it takes. In Africa right now, there are 12-year-old boys pastoring a church of hundreds. 12-year-old boys pastoring churches of hundreds. 
it could not be the wisdom of man. But those children just believe what they have read. And they believe inside of them there is a God and His Spirit is there. And He has spoken in His Word that He has given us power and authority and He's waiting on us to stand up and to do something. And just because you say something and it don't happen the first time, you don't get discouraged. Come back again. Come back again. A minister was holding a crusade and there were literally hundreds of people. He talked to his pastor and he said, get some men and women that are Christians and they're just living right. That's all I'm asking for. They're just living right. And so the man, a pastor gathered some men together that he believed he had confidence in. They wasn't no dynamo for God. They'd never been used of the Lord. He just got them together. And this evangelist said, God has given me power and authority. And I am going to lay my hands on you and I am going to tell you that the same power and authority that lives inside of me is going to li is living inside of you. And I am going to tell you that you are going to help, listen to this, you are going to help me pray for the sick. Ooh, me? Oh no. Well, if that's what your lips say, you eat your fruit. Go home and watch Bugs Bunny. I want you and you and you and you. And do you know there was a young man there that had never laid his hands on anybody? Because the evangelist could not get to the people. He called those people to come down, and the first man that come down to that young man was a man that had almost completely lost his sight. That minister said his hand was like this, and it wasn't the power of God. It was just trembling. He had never stood and took his authority in Jesus Christ. Never. Never. There's some of you here this morning. You have never taken your authority in Jesus. He laid his hand on that blind man, or almost blind. And he said, I spoke with words that I had never spoke before. You spirit of blindness, I command you to leave this man and if there be any disease, I command the disease. Well, who, you know some churches, who do you think you are? Well, should I show you a scripture? I'm a son of God. Well, you got a big head. Well, we need some other kind of head besides what you have because you don't believe. We're going to have to have somebody to step. And that young man prayed for that man. And that, oh, that man started screaming and shouting, saying, I can see, I can see, I can see. Healed by the power of God. That evangelist said it was all I could do to keep him seated. All he wanted to do is go around and lay hands on people. You see, that's what happens. That's what happens. The Holy Spirit is put on my heart. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. God is about to to open your eyes and he is about to put you in the harvest field and he is about to hallelujah to release his glory and his power stand to your feet this morning hallelujah yes yes
today. is the key you don't have to wait for an angel to show up you don't have to wait for a supernatural visitation the supernatural visitation was 33 and a half years of Jesus walking this earth and when he left he left his power and authority to his church it's time for you to rise up it's time for you to get your heart right. It's time for you to get your mouth right. It's time for you to understand your authority. Get old traditional prayers out of the way that hinders the moving of the power of God. And when you do that, we're going to see this church burst through those doors. Someone's going to come to you at work. And they're going to say, I, I, just, I just feel so sick. I just feel like going home. You say, wait just a minute. Can I pray for you? In the name of Jesus, you devil, God has given me authority over you. I take authority over this sickness in the name of Jesus. And I command this sickness to leave this body. And you don't have to scream. You can whisper, the devil isn't deaf. You can whisper. And you're going to start seeing God use you. And when he starts using you, there's something going to break inside of you. I put on my blog, preacher said revival, or the, the move falling in the revival is true. Revival is Holy Ghost chaos. The glory of God just falling and hitting everybody. It's for you. It's for you. I want you to turn around and greet someone this morning and sing with us. If you're a first time guest, we'd love to see you in the hospitality room. We love you. Look forward to seeing you tonight. Sing it. Hallelujah. Marching and moving. 